I see these all as positive things mm. because it's. I think this is all going to. It is going to force me all to innovate and be creative to solve bigger and better problems for people in the world. Yeah. And so I'm grateful for it. I'm here for it. And none of them are listed as excuses, but just observations of the changes that are occurring while I'm over there. And so I would just say to people listening, if you have that dream of wanting to travel and explore and do something that scares you a little bit, even if it's not convenient to business, to finances, to logistics, to your relationships, and you know inside you, you got to do it, just maybe like opening this gym. You do want it to feel comfortable, intimate. For sure. All right. I feel like this is that. No video guy. You don't need it? We don't need it. You know that, man. I'm the one-stop shop. Uh, to, to my detriment. I know that. Sometimes. Yeah, because then you do a lot of shit and you don't have much time for much else. But you do a lot of shit yourself. I do. Alexander, strength of Saad. Hello. Thanks for coming in, man. It's, uh, I feel very lucky that this worked out. Yeah. Cause I didn't think it was going to happen for a long time. Really? Because, mm. you know, for those who don't know, I've, I've moved to New York. I know. I want to talk about it. Yeah. How has New York been? As amazing as what it should be? I think a lot of people who have asked me, they're like, oh, how's it been? It's been amazing. You've moved to the, the, create one of the craziest cities in the world. For those who don't know, it's been a dream of mine to move to New York for, I would say, nearly eight years since the first time I went there. Mm. And I knew from that first moment I went there, I'm like, I got to move here. Mm. There's nothing that's going to stop me from living and working in this city somehow, some way, someday. What about the city is it that made you want to actually live there rather than be a visitor? It was the energy, the yep. culture, the, the just the... This is a hard one to describe because it was more of a feeling and I don't usually operate based on feeling. I usually primarily operate based on uh, logic mm -hmm. and cognitive coherence. By the way, we're recording? Yeah. That's how I roll us straight in, mate. mate that's, that's me and I'm like, I'm like, I got a reflection back on me. Like, this is how people feel? Because I'm like, you didn't see him hit the button, but that's the best way to do it because then it's natural. Mm. I've also been looking forward to just being on the other side of the table to our conversations. Yes, exactly, because mm. yeah. the table is now turned. A little bit of background for those that are listening. Alex and I have, uh, over the last few months, been engaged in a professional relationship as well where I have seeked out his advice as a mentor to help me with some of, uh, I guess, the evolution of Living Rewired and the Jungle HQ brand. So, very knowledgeable dude, uh, and, you know, I'll give you a... A really nice resume in the uh, podcast description where people can find out and, and learn more. But let's, let's continue. It. Thank you, homie. I appreciate that. Um, I, I love doing work with you and we have so much still to go. Mm. But for New York, it was a feeling. It was an intuition. I, I knew I had to move here uh, one day. I didn't want to regret not trying to do it. And since the, I went there a second time and a third time to visit. Mm. And I think from going second time and a third time, I knew it wasn't just a place I wanted to visit because I didn't get satiated from those experiences enough. Mm -hmm. I wanted more. And then long story short, after many years of, of working to, to get my businesses over there mm -hmm. and make it happen, I do it. And it was going to be one of two reactions. It was going to be a very emotional, overwhelming reaction or it was going to be very calm, grounded and like, okay, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the emotional reaction. It was the calm, almost dispassionate reaction where I was just, oh, I'm here. And since then, it is great. It mm. is. It's amazing. You go in the city. It's like, oh my gosh, New York. I've worked very hard to create a position for myself uh, with business where, you know, I can, my apartment looks out and I can see the city from it. Mm. And that's definitely an investment where I want to put uh, my finances because I want to be constantly reminded and inspired of that city that I'm in. Mm. And that daily reminder is, is a pinch yourself every day. I go up to the rooftop. I look at the, the view like from my apartment. I see the view. So that's, that's amazing. But it's also really challenging. Like there was an immense amount of pressure on me to perform the highest standard level possible now living and breathing and working in New York, because whether it's from the USD to AUD, so the AUD to USD currency, losing mm -hmm. nearly half your money and having to build uh, US clients and charging USD, or whether it's knowing almost no one mm -hmm. and building a network from scratch. I've, I come to Melbourne and I, you, I get like half a dozen to a dozen people hit me up or I hit them up and like do things like even this. Yeah, yeah. I go to New York, you go to a new city, I don't know if you've ever done it and you got to build from scratch and that is challenging. There are moments of isolation, there are moments of loneliness, there are 
there's a big pressure I put on myself to now perform at a higher level and race to a standard I've never done before. And so I just want to make it clear. It's not all like rainbow sunshines. Oh my God, I'm here. It's like, no, nah, this is, this is difficult. I, I assumed it would be. And I was interested to ask you a bit about some of those things in terms of, um, obviously you had the, you know, you'd imagined it in your mind before you'd even got there. That's right. What parts of it have been, you know, exactly how you imagined it would and what parts have uh, caught you a little bit off guard, if anything, that have been challenging? I assume that um, without knowing, you know, the in-depth detail of your finances, but the cost of living would be very expensive over there. Oh, man. And is that a part of it that's pushing you out of necessity to survive too? Yeah, and not just survive because I want to thrive. Yeah, of course. Right? You know, for example... Uh, you know, I'll go, let's say I order something from Uber Eats. I was getting uh, some Chipotle. It's like uh, Zambreras here in Australia. And you look at like, oh, I'm going to do $8, $9 for, for a nice meal here. Okay. Yeah. And then after the order finishes, I'm just giving an example. It goes $12, $14, $16. It, it pretty much doubles. And these are some of the things. And even though I've been there many times and I've even lived in America when I was 19, 20 years old playing basketball, even though I've done this before, it's something that it's like the, I can see the big difference in the cost of living. And of course, you know, being, I've ha- running successful businesses. I can do this very comfortably in Australia, but it's just a new level and a new challenge that I'm here for. And things are fine. Things are good. But I know I cannot maintain what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. If I want to survive and thrive for a long period of time, I know I need to create, innovate to new standards and levels. Otherwise, well, it won't probably look very good long term. Mm. So that's I believe it would be one of the more difficult cities to establish yourself in just due to that expense. Right. Yes, the cost of living is high. Yes, the currency conversion is, is not good. But look, I... I see these all as positive things because mm. it's. I think this is all gonna. Fo- it is gonna force me all to innovate and be creative to solve bigger and better problems for people in the world. Yeah. And so I'm grateful for it. I'm here for it. And none of them I list as excuses, but just observations of the changes that are occurring while I'm over there. And so I would just say to people listening, if you have that dream of wanting to travel and explore and do something that scares you a little bit. Even if it's not convenient to business, to finances, to logistics, to your relationships, and you know inside you, you got to do it. Just maybe like opening this gym. Doing something that scares you is always the right move. Yeah, man. Maybe not always, but pretty close. Yeah. Pretty darn close. Jordan Potts, my friend said to me. Oh, you know Jordan Potts too? Of course. Conscious mm. can't, you know him too? Yeah. So I, uh, when, I, when I first started my first gym in Melbourne, his now um, baby mama, Nicola. Yep. She was a client and friend, mm. and then we, we we've stayed in contact all through those through those years. And then she, you know when she met Jordan and was living up there, she's like, "You and Jordan will get along like a house of fire. You're so similar." Blah 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 blah. When they were in Melbourne, we did a podcast. We hit it off, and we've stayed in contact ever since. Great dude, it. he is man. Very uh, connected, yeah, um, to the world and people. And excuse me, he said, uh, "The treasure you seek is found in the cave you fear entering." Treasure you seek is found in the cave. Which is only a step away from what we just said about fear and that's being right. The, the right move. Um, and that's one of the things that's always surprised me about you, man, is it's how has it almost taken this long for us to meet? Because, you know, in, in a way, this energetic dude just started popping up on my screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said to you, that first conversation, you kind of even said to me, hey, why me? And I was just like, I oh, fuck with your energy. Yeah. I liked your energy. Uh, I think it's, it's very contagious energy whether it be good or bad um and in, in many ways i think people sometimes you're like some some successful people might resonate with this and they're like i need another version of myself and i do i see parts of myself in you and some similarities and just knew that there was things that i could absorb and uh take from you i appreciate that i think energy is very important it's contagious like you said and the environment that you keep yourself around and that you're in will influence your state via that energy transfer. So mm-hmm. I think it's one of the biggest hacks in life is that put yourself in an environment where the people, types of people are that you want to be. Mm. And that includes how the, the disposition, their energy that they bring. And I pride myself on not being the type of person, no matter what is happening in my life, is bringing a positive, uplifting, optimistic, a focused energy to the people around me. Where did you learn that? 
Where did that come from? Has it always been that way? No, it has not. I thank the game of basketball for giving me pretty much and crafting me to the person that I am today because 15, 16 years old was probably the, around the time where I was just nothing, just insecure, worthless, just low skill, low everything. Like I didn't feel like I was good at anything in the world. Mm-hmm. And I had just to decide, I'm going to be great at something. You know, Instead of crying myself to sleep because of X, Y, Z, I'm just going to, I don't know what, it just, I wish I could exactly remember, but there was a moment it just flipped. I was like, fuck it. I'm sick of this. Pick something. And because my environment, growing up in high school, mm. some of my boys were playing basketball. Mm. So I'm like, I'm, I'm all in. As the per- and, I, and I sucked, right? I had to build myself from nothing. And then when you suck at something so bad, you have to build yourself from nothing. You, you want to be great. You have to develop your character, physical, mental, to a type of way where you become very focused, very energetic, like, like unbeatable mentally. And where that comes from, your question, is a lot of that, w- is what I did for five, six years, dedicating my life to the sport of basketball. I think sport, dedicating yourself to, to a craft or a skill like that uh, can really change you as a person, and it did me. So it comes a lot from that. So what are the lessons the basketball taught you? Because I, I think sports are great for, obviously, that development of uh, you know resilience and mm. teamwork and bonding and work ethic and a lot of really valuable skills that translate into other areas of life. But was there anything specific to basketball that you feel that uh, it gave you? All of those things. I just, I'm trying to not repeat the same things that you just said. I think it gave me a confidence that if I can build myself from almost nothing to going to play in America and I have all the genetic and natural skill against me and I can still do something pretty good, like go play in America at 20, then what could I do if the cards were stacked in my favor? What if I picked something that I was naturally great at? So you feel like you're not, you weren't born a natural athlete? I describe it as going an uphill battle. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was average in many domains, but the one domain I was not average in was my work ethic and my my grittiness. Mm-hmm. It's like just like doing the dirty work. I can see that, and uh, that's really interesting for me because. Although I've said that we have some similarities, I feel like that's where we're sometimes a little bit opposite in our story. Is that uh, I was very gifted. Mm. So, um, you know, I'd be the cocky one who was good and winning without trying. That's right. Um, which gets you so far until it doesn't. Yeah. And then you're force fed that uh, very big hockey puck pill that reads responsibility and that, that this is nobody else's doing but yours because you didn't put in the work. That's right. You know? That's, that's a very nice parallel because we both get that hockey puck. Mm-hmm. I get it in the beginning, you get it later on. Mm. Like I realized it from the beginning and like I couldn't rely on this natural skill or this this genetic gifts of being 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six and X, Y, Z. So I just didn't have that. And I knew at the end of the day that nobody could ever take my effort away from me, my, my mental fortitude that I built, that I can build that all myself and that it, it doesn't matter as much what happens to you but how you respond. You know, that's that, tr- that the trite saying that we, we say before. And, and that's a big one that, that the game taught me. And all of these lessons, they carried me on still to this day. And I just think about, uh, it's hard to imagine the type of person, or I don't think I would be, we'd be uh, we absolutely would not be having this conversation. I wouldn't be in this industry, mm-hmm. most likely without the game. So, you know, if you have children or if you want children, I think exposing them to sport could be one of the the greatest gifts that you end up giving them <laughs> because it changed my life and now I'm playing a game being a functional health coach a business mentor entrepreneur where now I'm going downhill I'm not I'm mm. not going uphill anymore for the yeah, first yeah, yeah. time I found something where it sat and fit with my character so well 
where that energy came naturally, these conversations, these communications, because I realized how, how good I was mm -hmm. in the realms of connecting with other people. But again, I had to build that. But then there's, there might be something natural in there, regardless of wherever it came from, whatever it is. I have built it, and maybe there's something genetic as well. I'm leaning into that maximally, which is why we're here. It's, um, it's one of those things I was even thinking about before you came in, you know, like, and it's something I even have difficulty with in myself is describing what I do. Mm -mm. And I get I it. And because you are, you're many of those things. And I even, as a coach, you know, I have it written down here and it's something that I believed a long time ago and sort of uh, went down that path of understanding from, with enough self-awareness that, hey, I'm never going to be the smartest guy. You know, we got people like Ben Kant. We got people like Jake Carter, you know, these guys that we're somewhat affiliated with and they've, they've got that brain, you know, right. but I also don't need to be no. that guy. Um, and I actually firmly believe that the future of health requires experienced generalists, mm. not a specialist. And I definitely put you under that umbrella as someone who has a very broad umbrella with uh, general application. So let's get into your background a little bit, man. You've, you've spoken about obviously basketball and that's one of the things that sort of led you into the industry. I feel like that your earlier times in the health and fitness space was based around sort of sports science and strength and conditioning and Correct. that was probably affiliated with the basketball stuff. Um, I... I want to talk about, because I think there's a lot of value in the story, um, in the video message that you sent sent to Christian Woodford. Nice. But let's let's just, uh, yeah, start at the beginning there about how you sort of became, I, I guess, PT and throughout from there. Where did it start? It started from a conversation, like really, really it started, uh, is where I got home from basketball, uh, from America. How old? 20 mm -hmm. and I'm like what do I do now yep and I give this advice to my clients but what I did is I tried a bunch of stuff that I was interested in and I soon realized through a conversation with my mother actually that wait 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 wait. I remember exactly where I was in my bedroom I was like all right wait what have I been naturally learning about this whole time yep human health human science nutrition performance like how to optimize the body for maximal health and performance. I've been naturally learning about this through basketball because I had to, because I wanted to be a great athlete. Mm -hmm. and I've been starting this for, as a teenager. So I already have a leg up. It always comes from your own selfishness at the beginning, trying yeah, to improve. Of course. Which is good. I think that's honestly some of the best businesses and, and most uh, successful will come from solving self-orientated problems first. I know that sounds almost selfish, but... But I think selfish is also a word that gets brushed with a negative connotation mm. when it shouldn't always be because if you're not being selfish, what the fuck are you doing? Well, I would say to, to metaphorize that, mm. it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to pour from an empty cup. Mm. It's hard to pour from an empty cup. So I know if I can be, if I make myself and craft myself into the best human possible, that that is a beacon of light for many people. And I know this because people tell me, they tell me, oh man, because of X, Y, Z, the way you carry yourself, the way your business is, look what you're doing in America now, look at the way, the energy. I'm like, I want that. The business, the money, whatever. It's like, huh. And that, I believe, is a version of uh, pouring from a full cup. Now, where we began conversation, I realized I was doing it for many years, learning about it. And I was very, very curious. So all these people, like you can describe all these people, they're really smart, they got all the degrees, the PhDs, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's fine. What I've always had that I would argue is greater than almost anyone is obsession and curiosity. It's a very dangerous mix mm -hmm. because I've been obsessed to learn and learn and learn regardless of whatever limitation or whatever where I started. And I'm extremely naturally curious like maybe some of the questions you're asking, maybe you feel connected to that word as well. And that's a dangerous mix because if you're obsessed, you're not really going to stop. And if you're curious, that means the place you're coming from, from the questions you're asking and what you want to know is very, it's deep inside of you. It's like part of you. It's objective. It's open. It's not coming with an agenda. And so I realized I was very curious and very interested and a little bit obsessed from the beginning 
about human health and, and human science and everything about the human body. And then that, the, I already uh, did a diploma in, in, in the health field. Uh, and then I, I did another one to qualify myself as a coach because I didn't want to just do a Cert 3-4. We did an internship here, uh, work experience there, internship at Woodford's, became a coach there. But the first thing I did is I posted free coaching on a website that some may not know called Gumtree. Have you mm -hmm. ever heard of it? Yeah. I posted free. Gumtree kind of got knocked out by Marketplace. Okay. Yeah. Sort of. There you go. Anyway. Oh, you're, you're, you're posting free coaching on yeah, Gumtree. Yeah. I said, I, I'm, I'm, I want to get some. That's unique. I've never heard that. I've heard a lot of things, but not that. Right. I wanted clients. Yeah. I wanted to work with people and I really didn't have the skill set yet. So I wanted to practice. And so I posted on free and I got people and it wasn't. I was so uh, ahead in myself. I didn't even start with like PT one on ones. Mm -hmm. I started with like health coaching. Yeah, right. And I was definitely looking back like to a degree out of my depth, but I also was leaning on a lot of like knowledge I was learning from uh, the holistic health world from people like Paul Shack. But you're, but I understand that when you learn things, you get very excited to bring that into the world. Absolutely, and I did, yeah. and I coached a few people, and uh, you learn some lessons there, and. Then we get some coaching opportunities at a studio privately, not far from here. And then we go to Woodford's and then that changes my life and, and meeting Christian and making that video. I don't know if you wanted to ask about that because that was a part of your thing. I, I just uh, I just think it's um, very simple and something that won't date. But in the world of uh, social media that's meant to be connected, I feel that in many ways we're more disconnected than we ever have been and I don't know about you I'm sure you do I receive an abundance of cold messages from randoms every day trying to offer me their services whether it be marketing digital agencies xyz whatever it may be and it's just you don't even they're, they're all basically a cut, cut and paste That's right and when somebody sends you a video message again that energy is transparent you know who you're looking at. You can you can see their body language, their tone of voice. It 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 is going to dramatically skyrocket, I believe, any um, likelihood of that. You know, being closed. I have two opportunities that changed my life as a result of creating a video and going above and beyond. Because I'm always thinking like, I don't. If I do what everybody else is doing, I'm going to get what everybody else is getting. Yeah, no doubt. So you know this. This is why you're here and you're having this amazing gym, this amazing career that you have. So you know that. But I think the people listening, it's like, okay. It, I mean, there's so many meta examples. There's there's dating. It's like, okay, is the per is the love of your life, the person that you want, are they on the dating app? Or are they so focused on their life, their career, their health, their wealth, that like they're not the type of person who's going to be on that app? Or is it, mm. <laughs> is it the job opportunity? I think a lot of people, they put in all these resumes. I help a lot. I was going to say, the resume, it's dead, surely. Well... No, I don't know. I've never had a job. But <laughs> I've actually, that's funny you say that because I've actually had like half a dozen like shitty kind of like eat shit jobs we can talk about. But when I go back and when I talk to my clients and uh, I help them transition through, you know, my coaching extends to a lot of very holistic. We help them through the transitions of life. And that includes jobs, uh, deaths, um, pregnancies, everything. And so when, when, I, when people are bringing up that they're talking about finding a new job, I'm like, all right, first we go volume. I need you to separate yourself and just you, you need to maximal volume. Like if you want, if you need a job, you just need some money. It's like, okay, volume. But then more importantly than that is, have you tried going down there mm. and speaking to a human face to face? Like yeah. how many people do that? Not many. So my point about the example of the video is I sent a video to Christian Woodford. Say, hey, I, w I think I was asking for a coaching position, right? And I, I, it was ended up being the internship. So I went hard out the gate. And then I saw the video got like 11 views. I'm like, how has it got 11 views? It's unlisted. He must have sent it to his team. So I'm like, okay, something's happening here. And then- How, how did that feel? Something falling out your ass? A bit nervous, excited? Do you think it's a positive yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah. Pro a little bit of like uncertainty, nervousness, but also excitement for sure. Mm. You know that, because people understand like Woodford's back then, like they were, like no one was doing what they were doing. They were way ahead of the game. I, I, I believe Woodford's should be a multi, they should be the biggest and best gym in Australia. They should be a multi-million dollar gym just killing it. But uh, now there's all this competition around as well. He's inspired a whole bunch of other amazing gyms and coaches. Are they tailored toward, um, and excuse my ignorance about the Woodford uh, setup, are they specific to 
a type of sport or just sports no, science? Total athletic strength development. Strength and conditioning in general. Yeah, cool. Cool. So I do that video and it gets me the internship and it impresses and, re and respects Christian. And then what actually made me uh, decently nervous mm -hmm. was we had these shadowing hours. We had to do part of the placement. I'm like, okay. I got a shot. If I want to learn the most and if I want to separate themselves and actually get a job here, which I did mm. as an SSE coach, then I have to be around the decision maker and the leader in the room. And that's Christian. And Christian at the time, very domineering in like, he still is, but like intimidating figure that if you're not confident in your own skin and you don't have experience in the game, like he'll, he'll weed you out. Like you'll, you know, it's a sink or swim. It's like, yeah, you get found out. Yeah, you get found out. Right. So I'm like, fuck it through the nervousness. I'm going to shadow the top dog to begin with. And so I'm, you just, I'm just putting myself around those people. So I do that video, it gets me, yep, coaching position. Long story short, I can tell more details there. But then I do it for another opportunity at uh, Melbourne United. It's a, the professional NBL sporting club. And I, in my diploma, they have an, they have an opportunity that they put out to us. That there's an internship available at the professional Australian basketball club, Melbourne United in Melbourne. So I'm like, hell yeah, I want that. One position available. Students apply, even teachers apply. I'm like, all right, I'll do the written document. I'll do what you want me to do, but I'm going to go above that. I'm going to make a video. So I made a video for Eric Hollinsworth, who is to this day, one of the most eclectic, brilliant, but wild leaders in uh, the sporting professional industry that I've met. He used to be the head of athletics uh, Australia. Works uh, worked, coached at the Olympic level, and I got an interview, and then we did a second interview, and I got the position, I got the internship, and it was all because of this video that helped separate me. And to this day, I still apply that. Whether that's now, I'm just doing it at a higher level. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, Stephen Bartlett. Yep. You heard him? Maybe the yeah, Diary of CEO yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I so like I have a video on my YouTube right now for Steven f uh, for a position that I've created. Now, this is super high level, right? This is going from, from where we started to where we are. Uh, <laughs> now, he posted a job on LinkedIn saying, I, I want you to work for me. He said, basically, create a position. If it's good and you have evidence, I'll consider hiring you. I've sent him 20 plus emails. I have made a video. I spent like three, four hours drafting a really like critically analyzing the situation to see what I could bring to the table. So, I've done that. I've sent that to him. No response yet. That's fine. Mm. I'll try for another year because the, the opportunity potentially is so massive that it would be silly of me not to keep trying. And another one, uh, I'm exploring with James Smith PT. Okay. And they're all like personalized going above and beyond actions to separate myself, to create a reality that I want and to help people in ways that they haven't considered. And I'm just trying to always think and deliver. Like, how can I go outside of the mold? I'm even offering to these people. It's like, I'll fly to where you are right now. Mm -hmm. Like, so, so just thinking, if you want something you've never had, do something you've never done. And this has been a, a track record that has worked for me. And eventually it will work again. And then people will say, oh my God, look how big you are. Or maybe, maybe not. I don't really care that much about it. But they'll say something about the next big opportunity I get. Mm. And they'll ask how. Yeah. But the clues are here. It's not a singular thing. No. Yeah. It reminds me uh, a little bit of a story within my own path was when it would have been in 2000 and probably 2012, 2013. So 10, 10 plus years ago now. And uh, this is when sort of internships and uh, seminars were kind of finding their way to the health and fitness industry. And Luke McNally and Chris Dufay were uh, advertising one up in the Gold Coast there. So Luke McNally being the founder of um, Mass Nutrition. Do you remember Mass Nutrition? No. Really? Uh, I don't think they exist anymore, but they ended up being the biggest supplement franchise across Australia, and they had some in New Zealand as well. He was an ex-Mr. Australia, learned under Poliquin, uh, coached Scott Goebel and Shembury and those guys to the stage. So okay. big, big in the bodybuilding world. But he really, really brainiac guy. Either way, I had a fuck uh, issue with my email at the time, so I I called. They he said they, they'd spoken to you know a couple hundred people in the uh, you know you had to apply for the uh, internship. Got the offer on the phone. Cool, I'm on board. Locked in. Issues with my emails. No emails came. It's the night before the internship. I'm now up in Queensland. 
I haven't heard anything, but I'm like, fuck it. I'm that pumped about it anyway. Sent them a message saying, hey, guys, where's, where's everything kicking off tomorrow? Then got the spiel. But it, that worked out to be one of the most pivotal and best things that had ever happened because of the fact that I was there and didn't receive any of the emails that had all been cancelled. They were like, have a fucking go at this young fella. Just, just turning oh. up there anyway. And they're like, you know what? Be at the gym tomorrow at 9 a.m. It was cancelled. It was cancelled. And wow. You, and but you I was there in. anyway. Yeah. I hadn't heard anything, but I was just that keen I love to that. learn that I went anyway. And I'm sitting there in my apartment in, in Sunshine Coast. Oh, sorry. In, um, Gold Coast some, somewhere before the night before. And uh, we were speaking to them. So I ended up turning up to the gym the next morning at... Um, at the gym with Luke and spent basically the next week with him and he, he pretty much filmed a private internship for me and just created content out of it. Wow. But obviously the value I received was far superior being in that that one-on-one uh, space which, and then the, the relationship was formed and, and that was kind of, you know, the circuit breaker which opened my eyes up to, I guess, holistic health nutrition, detoxification and everything that becomes, you know, valuable in the, in the coaching space, you know. Thank God your email stopped working. Mm, true. Everything they say sometimes happens for a reason. Maybe that was the reason. But the point is you, you went at it. You still w- reached out. You didn't just accept. Oh, mm. it's probably not happening. I'll just sit back. You created an opportunity pretty much for yourself. Mm. Well done. So you've, uh, you're in the strength and conditioning space. Because you, you started out at 69 kilos. Yeah, even lighter. So you saw that Instagram story. Yeah. Yeah. So- but you're a pretty big boy now. I'm 20 kilos heavier. Yeah. And I got, as you see, I want, I want another 5, 10 kilos. Yeah. So you, I know you've had uh, a dabble in the powerlifting space. A dabble in definitely like strength training towards powerlifting. I've never powerlifted and competed, but no, no, training at strength culture yeah. has exposed me to that world. Yeah. And now more so a little bit into the body composition space sort Absolutely. of has the evolution of your own training sort of gone the evolution of my training has gone from strength and conditioning athletic development yeah to realizing that i'm obsessed with this functional movement functional uh i like put it on a pedestal and i and i stigmatized bodybuilding and people who wanted to get jacked and big because i was very obsessed with athletic development mm-hmm. and i realized wait you can have both of course idiot yeah. and then once I met Ben, Ben Can, uh, my business partner and friend now, and uh, he uh, has helped me get into the best shape of my life. At 69 kilos, I was ripped, lean, 4 5% body fat. You can go on my YouTube and see it, Strength of Sard, and you can see the transformation and journey and what that meant to me. I shaved my head. I was like this very important transformation of, of spirit and body and being. And he first exposed me to like traditional bodybuilding and those programs, and I loved it. Mm-hmm. And I loved training that hard, which I've never trained that hard before, and, and getting bigger and stronger every week, every day. And that is now a predominant of my training. And I still absolutely continue athletic development within that mm. hybrid. And I've recently seen, while you've uh, been in New York, you've started boxing with some real old school, That's right. proper New York style boxing gyms and uh you know, I saw the video where you said, you know, people think they're training hard when they're doing, you know, bodybuilding style training Hell when you're resting for fucking three minutes in between each oh set of eight. Um, and they just don't know, do they? They don't know. How you been finding that? I love it. Yeah? It's so humbling. It's bringing me back to my day. Like, I've never worked harder since I played basketball. It was so long ago, eight years ago, nine years ago, where they'd kill you so hard. Yeah. You'd be in pools of sweat, heart rate 190. I'm back there. Mm. And I love it. Boxing training is no joke. You know? I fought a few times. Did you? Mm. So I don't, this is where I don't know your history as much. You fought a few, like amateur stuff in Melbourne? Yeah. How was that for you? It was really good. Um, It was just, it was kind of, oh, again, sort of the flip the script to you is that I kind of started out in the bodybuilding style training. Never wanted to compete or have had any desires to be in a G-string in fake tan and have also played just as many poking jokes at that community uh, as probably what you have. But a lot of that was probably fueled by, um, you know, aggression that existed within my mind. And yeah. it sounds weird that ag- aggression being disappearing going into boxing. But, you know, you might have discovered already that uh, boxing and martial arts aren't actually about 
aggression. They're very cerebral. No, like Coach K, like I say, first of all, I, I train at Gleason's gym. This mm. is a, I, so it's really important to me that, and in general for like um, the biology of the brain is when you learn a new skill, mm. motor learning, when you learn a new skill, it's very important that you learn a skill proficiently under someone who's exceptionally skilled in teaching that mm. skill. And sometimes the best at it weren't the best coaches. Right. That's a great point too. Mm. It helps if you can have both though. And so I, it was important to me I didn't just go to some average Joe boxing gym because if it's a new skill for me, mm. I want to be taught. I don't want to have to relearn patterns later on when someone tells me, oh, you're not squatting right. Yeah. Oh, you're not. Um, it's a lot harder to unlearn than it is learned. That's right. right. Yeah. So knowing that, I, I seeked out uh, Gleason's boxing gym and Overthrow. Gleason's is in Brooklyn. Overthrow does great group training. Uh, in the city. And Gleason's is a place that has had world class fighters, the Malalis, uh and, yeah, and the Tysons. Wow. That's cool. So there's all these like framed photos that and every coach there, pretty much every coach there, has been a world champion mm. at some point. OG guys. I got my, my coach cat is, is my coach. And you talk about the speed of it and he actually tells me, like, slow down. Mm -hmm. Slow down. And I love that because I understand that to learn and master a proficient skill, that learning under fatigue and learning under like really fast conditions is not a very good way to learn a new skill in the beginning. And I tried a different trainer as well. No, because in some ways it's almost like ingraining inefficient movement patterns yeah. and you're re not recruiting any fast twitch muscle fibers anymore. Right. It just, just becomes a bit... So yeah. he, he rests me between rounds, which I like. The other trainer killed me. I was doing push-ups and sit-ups and training super hard uh, the whole time. And, and I, I like Coach Cat because he, he's more mediated. And I love boxing because it's very honest. Mm -hmm. You get a very immediate feedback like no other when you make a mistake. That's right. You, you know this. You fought. Yes. And doing a bit of sparring with people, just just like hitting pads and you're, he'll he'll punish me immediately. if I drop that right hand. He's like, I'm on the ground. Yeah, right. There's, there's an immediate like consequence, and I think it's the duty of of every man, every self respecting man, to learn how to fight and defend the ones he loves. And so, I agree. This has come from a very practical standpoint. It's come from also being in New York City, where it ain't no Melbourne. Oh, you might need to do that one day. That's right, and so. I think it's very important to me that I'm prepared mm -hmm. and that for my future children that they will have as well, that they can look up to a father who knows how to protect them under all circumstances. And I don't just mean fighting. I mean spiritually, emotionally, mentally. I mean uh, being able to be able to handle a weapon as well. Mate, I understand. Mate, when I think of what living rewired means from a training point of view, it's exactly that. Yeah, of course, we all want to look better with our clothes off and have a little bit more confidence. But it's also to give me the freedom in my life that if I want to tear up that mountain, we can tear up that mountain. I want to lift this heavy thing, I can do that, lift that heavy thing. It That's actually right. makes life a little bit easier and then finally be able to protect myself from the ones that you love around you. Yeah. Oh, you said protect myself from the... the no, oh, sometimes. Sometimes maybe. <laughs> yeah, no, but protect myself and the, uh, the ones I love around me. I get you. Because at the end of the day, all this muscle mess, man. Mm. Like, it doesn't help you in the boxing game. Like, what use is it all unless you can defend yourself, unless you can fight? And m pretty much every fight starts on your feet. And I think jiu-jitsu as well is, is valuable as well. And I'm going to learn skills in an in intelligent sequence. And I couldn't recommend enough, not just f like absolutely for men, and even to an extent for women, just to gain a greater confidence on their their physicality. Mm -hmm. On the, They just walk down the street by themselves and, and they're feeling vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It does, it does wonders to your, your confidence. Even just five, six sessions that I've done, it's like there's a noticeable difference in, I, I want to acknowledge, I, I am still not good, right? <laughs> I understand. There's a plenty more to learn. But even just with some of the basic foundations. It means you know more than 99% of people. Right. And that I carry myself with, but very careful not to carry myself with an overconfident stunning Kruger effect myself. Mm. So I love it. Couldn't recommend it enough. I can't wait to do more of it. I, I now, sh uh, a little thing I do now is I now shadow box and hit the bag as warm up yeah. before my weight training to keep rehearsing and practicing the skill. Yeah. But I just wish I wasn't. I want to fight, but the more and more I've learned about concussions and TBI. Which is why I stopped. Yeah. I just like, 
Because I've got a history of bad head, head knocks. So really? um, I basically got forced to stop playing football because mm-hmm. I'd been knocked out nearly 10 times. Um, really? Got put in a coma. Um, lost three months of memory. What? Came back, got knocked out again. So I sort of stopped that. Oh, man. And then hadn't, hadn't played for 14 years, but then boxed. But, you know, it, it's... But at the same time, I, I too have the awareness of obviously traumatic brain injury and what's going on and and it, it was more just something that I had always wanted to fulfill and hadn't done but definitely the, the wear and tear on the body and even just the fact that you know I, I have other priorities in my life yeah. I've got a business to run so you know I go and train and now the peripheral vision's gone because I've been hitting the head sparring you know the rest of my day's fucked yeah you know and I, and I also just yeah I'm thinking long term there's some stuff. So bo- boxing's not very forgiving in that sense. No. And there's a big part of me as a man that really wants to do it. Mm. And there's the other kind of logical rational that is like, well, future Alexander, mm. future cognition, fu- future memory, f- like Alzheimer's, um, violent behavior tendencies, uh, just mortality. These things I'm like, ah. So, yeah, but you're always going to, you're going to die eventually. You will? You will. Not everyone lives. No. But quality of life is important. Yeah. Uh, but these are the things I go back and forth on. Look, you might see me one day uh, going against this. That's one of the things why I like jujitsu, though, you know, is it's allowing me to scratch a True. very similar itch yep. uh, without the head injury. Yeah. But if anybody's combated this and confronted this, message me because I'd love to see how you guys talk about it. There's one point it's like, don't be a bitch, just fucking do it. And there's the other part of it's like, yeah, you know, there's a real considerations. What I found really interesting because you were asking me about it before, though, just what my experience was with, mm. with boxing is fighting is actually easy. The weeks leading up to it are not. Mm, anxiety and it, yeah it's not not the um it's not even the physicality of course the training's hard but it's the mental torment that i place upon myself with an expectation not to lose and get beaten up in front of your friends and uh and that that's that's the hardest part because it's so consuming that it does it over it, it, the volume overpowers everything else in my mind well it did for me i love but that mental come, of it. Come, yeah i love it too i love it too um and then but come come fight day it's just neutral. It's I'm there. There is no emotion. It was just go, mm. which was always in just an interesting experience. I Absolutely. don't know what it's like for everyone, but that's how it's always been for me. I've heard that's been quite common, even with you know I watch the UFC and quite a few UFC fighters talk about that. And GSP, the one f- one of the fights he lost where he was not ner- he's usually nervous and sick like the day before every fight, mm. and the one fight that he wasn't. So when he got beaten, he against, lost. Um, Matt, not Matt Hughes. Someone against, he underestimated. Yeah, uh, Matt Serra, I think it was. Okay, well, yeah. someone he underestimated, and this, this is that nervousness that gives you focus. But I would love, I, I love the idea of that because you get to practice the mindfulness and the detachment and the attachment you have to the outcome, like the shame and the humiliation of being beat in mm. front of your friends, or the anxiety of losing. But what if I could enter this almost Buddhist Taoist-like state where I was completely unattached to the outcome? I was floating mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Like this is like almost like practice for that. It's a great mm, yeah. challenge for mm-hmm. that mentally. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's one, one of those things that's so irrational too because those, those fears were not even real. Like the people that were there supporting me, who loved me, wouldn't think anything mm. less of me even if I did lose. But it's just your own internal that's right. perception that you create. In created. fact... They sometimes end up admiring you more by the way you handle the loss. For sure. Like graceful uh, losses where you, you know, you dap up your opponent and you keep your head high and you don't disparage your opponent mm. and you self reflect honestly. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's I, like I sometimes, it depends on the mood and the mindset that I'm in. But I can sit here almost when I'm detached emotionally from it and maybe I'm not involved and really think that there is no shame in the loss. It's like this, this is martial arts. This is. This is boxing and it's competition. You're competing. You didn't lose, especially if you lost on points. You didn't get knocked out in front of someone. Mm. You know, it's a bit of the Nate Diaz thing. Yeah, you beat me in a boxing match. But you didn't actually beat me in a fight. That's right. And he knows within his heart of hearts that yeah. if it's a real fight. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. Kobe Bryant, I was watching this interview of Kobe Bryant. Mm. And, and, and the interviewer asked him, well, do you hate losing more or love winning more? He's like, neither. It's like, and then he began to talk about how. What was the question again? Do you hate? Do you losing, hate losing more, or do you love, love winning, winning more? more. Right, that was a version of that question. 
What would your answer to that question be? Do I hate losing more or do I love winning more? Look, I'm biased because I got exposed to Kobe's answer and I really like it. Mm. And I, I love the neither answer. Like I want to be the neither answer, which is detached from, you can have a preference of what the outcome you want to be, but like ultimately detached from the outcome. And it's like, I'm here to learn. Mm -hmm. If I win and if I'm so attached to winning, then I might miss, uh, if I don't win, then suffering, pain. If I lose and I attach myself to avoiding losing so much, you can begin to create the thing that you want to avoid. Mm -hmm. But if I just focus on learning and growing and the process, regardless of the outcome, then I can't lose. You can't lose, yep. And so if I was to ever get in the ring and fight, I would hope that I can adopt that mental framework and, and mindset and put... Because there's a definitely an ego associated with avoiding losing and winning, mm. especially as a man. So that would be the challenge. And so if you just focus on learning, then you win every time. Powerlifting, bodybuilding, boxing, evolution from being a coach from you know, training and nutrition mm. into business coaching. How did that transition occur? People ask me. Yeah. It's very natural. Okay. It's not most of the stuff that I've done, a lot of the stuff I've done, I should say, mm -hmm. has just been by people asking me. Yeah. Like I've added dating and relationship and money and business now as a coaching feature to my general clients. Yeah. I'm not a formal dating coach. I'm not a uh, financial advisor. Mm -hmm. Why? Because those were the conversations that people were bringing up with me and I was sharing stories, sharing insights naturally. And these are, these are areas and domains of my uh, knowledge pool that yeah. I was sharing. And so to answer your question directly, people were beginning to see that my business was becoming more successful. I coach many coaches. Yep. As you know, about 50% of my client pool is coaches. The rest is just average population. General, I should say. They started to ask me, what can I do about my business? What can I do about marketing and money and et cetera? And it just came from that. It just came from a natural demand. And from that was birthed a general one-on-one -on -one, uh, business structure and framework in just a, a basic Google Doc. And now it's turned into a formal business mentorship. And that's even expanded out to Trinity, which includes business mentorship, is in my entire complete package, 14-month coaching program. So to answer it, natural demand people asked me to do it. So let's have a talk about that. That was one of the things that I definitely wanted to get into uh, today because I believe it'll bring value to some of our listeners, which often are young and in the industry themselves. And I too have had, um, you know, plenty of opportunity and experience to mentor people within the industry to uh, to grow their business. And we see a lot, like PT is a popular industry. It's quite saturated. Yes. A lot of people enter it. I think a lot of people uh, fall on their face because they um, miscalculate what's actually involved in running a successful P PT business. You don't get your cert three and four and have people just coming out of the woodwork saying, hey, take me on as a client, take me on as a client, which I think is somewhat the, uh, the perception that exists a little bit sometimes. So let's have a chat about uh, where we think young PTs are going wrong and where there's some of their biggest opportunities to improve and run a successful business. One thing that comes to mind is environment. I was just talking to nine of my mentees this morning over our growth call. And one of the things, the mistakes that they make is they put themselves in an environment that isn't conducive to the ultimate goals and success that they want. For example, it's funny because now I'm recommending a lot of, like most of my mentees mm -hmm. go work at a commercial gym. This is so opposite antithetical to how I began. I don't think I've ever, no, I've not even worked at a commercial gym, but why would I suggest that? A good commercial gym can change your life from a financial and an experience and a skill set perspective because they're a, they're a vehicle to give you leads. I agree. And to fail safely. And a lot of coaches and PTs with almost zero following, that's their problem. Mm -hmm. Leads. Where do you get leads? You can come here to a jungle HQ or a gym like this, but if, I'm t if they're going to a private gym, like many of them have gone to private gyms, and they've had mixed results because private gyms, like I, if someone comes here to Jungle HQ, then I got to make sure right, we got to we got to make sure we do the vetting correctly. How many leads per week? What are the other coaches doing? And we got to vet the things carefully because a private gym generally doesn't have as much leads, obviously, as a 
commercial fitness first with hundreds and thousands of members. Exactly. So if you don't have the social media following, which you probably don't when you're starting out, it can be hard to leverage those clients. Exactly. So hence why I recommend that getting yourself an environment where you know that you have a high degree of confidence that you're going to get a lot of leads and be able to test your marketing, your sales ability, your communication, your coaching skill set, be able to run workshops in those environments uh, and fail comfortably and safely and move forward. And so you'd be asking the gyms that you go to, you've uh, you got to ask the coaches who work there what, what, what it's like there. You've got to ask them how many leads do you get per week? How many leads does the gym get? How many active or not, how many active members are there? How many of the type of people that you want to coach there? Like your demographic, is it women? Is it men? Is it both? You've got to vet carefully mm. and then move into the gym and then don't be afraid if it's not working to pivot and move out of it to another opportunity. But the commercial gym environment, the environment that you keep around you will change your life. It did mine, particularly at, at Woodford's, but I had to build years. I didn't care about no leads, man. I just coached. Mm. Just give me, just, I'm a coach. I, I get paid, man, like $10, $14 an hour when I started. Mate, I feel so strongly about this, right? Because there are so many people that are finding themselves into the online coaching space that haven't spent any time in the face-to-face -face on the gym floor as well. Absolutely. And whether it be that you're offering up your service for, services for free, it's giving you the opportunity to hone your craft, right? So I kind of figured out when I was new and I started the personal training company before I grew it to have four trainers under me before I actually opened the facility mm -hmm. that my numbers that I discovered that were my benchmarks is that I needed to speak to 20 people in the gym to get five complimentary sessions booked in and out of that five complimentary sessions, I would land one of those clients as an ongoing. It's just math. Meaning that if you want to get a book of 30 clients, that's 600 people and a fuckload of no's that you're going to have to get comfortable here. I love that. You know, so it is, that's your opportunity to get comfortable with being told no mm -hmm. and continually self-reflect on where that conversation went wrong. Absolutely. And if you do not do the self-reflection, then how are you to grow and learn from the past errors and mistakes. And this is why I tell all my mentees, record your calls, mm. record the conversations, voice, audio, video, because then you can dissect and critically analyze the things you did well and things you didn't do well. And I think it's one of those things that like people love to say, fake it till you make it, but it also doesn't really work because people know if you're faking it. Like, and what I mean by that is we all need to start with a script. Framework, yeah. But if that script sounds like a script, that's going to be very transparent. You need to know your script. You need to have test run it enough right. times for it to no longer actually be a script and for it to be you. And that's why I, like, I tell my mentees, like, chase your curiosity in these conversations. Like, mm. Be I, flexible with it. Yeah, be adaptable. And like, it's people, they're going for a sale. They, they, the outcome is the sale. They're obsessed with the money in the yeah. sale. So like, well, hold on, hold on. You're not trying to make the sale. You're trying to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. You're there to solve a problem for them. So before you solve a problem, you have to understand their problem. You have to do enough research. And so in our first conversation, like I got to listen to you 80% of the time to gather the necessary information to see if I can help you. Mm -hmm. And so that's a mistake that I commonly see is that people are, uh, they're focused on the outcome more than to see if they can help. And so what I try, what I do with all my mentees is I get them to Buddhist, Taoist, detach from the outcome and purely accept the whatever's going to happen. It's okay, whatever happens, whether they work with you or whether they not, but that you're there to see if you can jigsaw piece together and be a good fit. So one of the things was environment. This is another thing. What was the original base of the question? Just where we see the common uh, mistakes occurring and so many. what would be the... Uh, they try and do it themselves. Yeah. It's like, even you, mm -hmm. you're a seasoned vet. You got a gym successful, multi-six figures, things are going really well, mm -hmm. right? But you still, I, I, I read much respect about you, Jack, because you still, you're like, you know what? Regard, regardless of, of age, regardless of where this person's been, it's like, I know I can level up and then I'm gonna get a mentor again. Mm -hmm. And if a guy like you is doing that at this level, well then what chance does the PT coach who knows almost nothing, mm -hmm. respectfully, knows almost nothing from day one, is averse 
to getting mentored or hiring a coach. They're a coach who doesn't have a coach. It's a degree of ironic fuckery that is hard for <laughs> me to fathom. Yeah, true. And so I would encourage and empower coaches to find other coaches and mentors to help them. And if you don't have money, offer something else in exchange. What can you do to help them? For example, one of the first That's things I did for Christian is media work. Yeah. But, oh man, another, there's another version of me in a, in a different reality who's running like a seven-figure... Me- I could probably have been more uh, successful from a financial perspective running a media company because I started so early. Before there was all these video guys, it's so popular now, you hit DMs all the time from like people trying to edit your videos and all these reels. Before there was that, I was doing that for Woodford's and I got a lot of inspiration from Gary Vaynerchuk and we created the Ask Woodford show mm-hmm. as an inspiration from Gary V's Ask Gary V show. Yeah, right. and this wasn't happening in the fitness industry, but we started this early. And I still to this day believe it's the best podcast they've ever done. And we, I, I did this and I did Shandor Earl's series I came up with the idea, hey, he's going to return to the NRL after this, after this ban, this four-year ban. I had a GoPro, a GoPro 4, and I just, I, re- I recorded the documentary, edited all myself off a GoPro. I negotiated a little bit of money, but it first started off for free, then it was a retainer, and then it was this, and it opened doors for me. And then Christian's like, all right, I'm, I, want a, I want a coaching position here. He's like, all right, start your degree. Done. Started it in. Changed my life. Changed my life. But obviously, coaching was my thing. Health science was my thing. Human, human, uh, human thing. Human science was my thing. So I didn't go down the media route, obviously. Uh, but there was an opportunity there to do something pretty big. And now other people are taking that. But I offered a, an alternative skill set that I just developed and had. Bartering ain't dead. That's a good one. No way. Mistakes. All right. Mistakes. Giving up, um, offering your services in exchange if you do not have. Finances to invest. Absolutely. It's a great one. Go, go work for free somewhere. Like, like if you just, I have problems to solve. If you come to me and you say, hey, I'd like to get coached by you, but I can't afford X, Y amount. I, I want to transform my health. I have these problems, but I don't know what I can do for you. Okay, first of all, that's, you can say, I don't know what you can do for you, but then now I have to do work for you to figure out like a role for you. Okay, then you put work onto me. Yeah. Now, that's one way, but I, I do have things that I have to do for you, but you could analyze, critically analyze my business and, and the points that you think that you could be helpful with. Listen to the podcast, someone, listen to what I'm, what I'm struggling with. I just posted, I need a marketing and brand director, okay? Uh, I, PA is someone that uh, would be really helpful to me. Analyze and look at where the the time points are in someone's business where, where, they, where they could be delegating or outsourcing, outsourcing tasks. See, suggest if you can fill that role. And you might be surprised in the people that you can connect with and the doors that you can open. I wouldn't necessarily start off with the big dogs, like the people with half a million, 100,000, 50,000 followers. Mm. I would start off with the people that are reachable. Like you can DM me and I'll respond. But you can't DM James Smith PT without him and him responding unless you know somebody that follows him and they follow each other and then they help you connect with him, which is exactly what happened to me. Yeah. So, barter. Yes. And what is the opportunity that you're looking for with him? <sighs> he's obviously killing it. He is. Uh, I will just say an event. A possible event. They're doing very big events. They're doing very well. You can look up James Smith PT. He's probably the most successful PT uh, in in the world and they will be selling out 50 plus thousand uh, person um, ticketed events they're now going they're going to go to arenas next year they're doing very well not to uh, potentially shit on that opportunity but what do you think about James's message because I don't necessarily see it aligning with yours which which message nutritional philosophy and ethos I suppose I mean I don't think there's anything I've vehemently disagreed with uh, mm. I think we'll have our differences here quite a, a simple uh, framework and approach, uh, but no. Uh, if you look at it from a base message of like holistic health and mindset, like some things align and some things are a bit different. Uh, but I want to do epic shit with f- epic people, mm. and I want to connect and get to know more it's people in audience. this industry. It is, mm. uh, but we're talking. Uh, I don't know if they'd be interested because I can't offer something extremely big like they're talking about, and so I have to think. 
what would something if something happens something happens if something doesn't something doesn't i'm unattached okay what so if you think as a person you want to work with what would someone who's out of your league how could you make it a no-brainer for them it's a, it's a question that i try and ask myself how do i make this a no-brainer decision how do i make this a no-brainer opportunity that would be a hell yes opportunity that would be silly to turn down and so I, I crafted my own version of that and I made a video for them. And I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, we will see what happens. I'm excited to see how that unfolds. Tell me about Catabasis. Catabasis is my joint co-collaboration business with my friend, old coach, and business, a business partner, Ben Kant. Benny Lifts on Instagram. He's been on this podcast. Mm -hmm. Brilliant man. It is our joint podcast together. Yeah. A vehicle for us to collaborate and network with guests. We'll have you on one day, of course. And it is a place for us to collaborate and, and uh, release uh, courses and products and digital products as well. Because uh, it just naturally happened where, I don't know if you know, but when Ben coached me, mm -hmm. I was asking That's him. That's how that relationship it's started? That's how it started. Yep. And he noticed some positive behaviors in me and the questions I was asking, the things that I was learning in my tenacity to learn in the... and. I was presenting myself unbeknownst to me in a really positive light to him. And when I asked him about uh, starting, you know, do, doing things, different things in business, it naturally came up to do a collaboration thing together. And it was birthed from our, our coaching relationship. And now it's a vehicle for us to, to release education, uh, joint workshops, uh, joint content to the world. And we have a really good synergy and balance between this, this youthful energy that I have mm -hmm. uh, and this, this, the skill set that I have and the the wisdom that he has and the, it's uh yeah it's a, it's a great relationship. It is, man. I think you're a really good living example of just creating your your own opportunities. That's right. Pe people need to understand. There's not just a thing as you getting lucky. People people aren't just here to giving out fucking success. Mm. You know what I mean. You got to create your own path, and it's awesome to see, man. You were on your way over to New York, or before you did, you went back to your homeland. Mm. to Egypt. Yes. And uh, you spoke of personal discoveries. Yeah. Um, I just want to hear a little bit about your time in Egypt to uh, to probably wrap this up, man. I like this conversation because it's it's very diverse. Uh, I Place could, I really want to go. I couldn't recommend it enough for everybody. So for those who don't know, uh, my mother was born in Egypt. My grandparents are Egypt. Strength of Saad, my business, Saad, on my shirt right now. It's your grandfather? It's my grandfather. Exactly. He knows. The other side uh, is Greek ancestry, and I'm born in Australia. I went to Egypt on a tour. I invited my mother to come, and then we spent one week in Alexandria, which was our home city where she was born. This is a very, very special trip to me. As many things that I took away, it changed me as a person and as a man. I feel extremely more deep connected to my ancestry and my roots. I feel an obligation and responsibility to go back and give back to that country because the average person, could you guess what the average person in Egypt is living off? Uh, I'll give you per month. You might be surprised, you know, you think Egypt, okay, is it poor, is it rich? What's, hmm. I'd guess low. Your guess would be right. Mm. But I couldn't give you a numerical figure. All right. I'll give you it's about 150 USD a month, which call it 10 to 20 USD a day. Okay. Pretty poor country. And there are, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, nearly 100 million people there. It's a big population. Yeah. And most of the, they live in about 5%. I was about to say, a lot of it would be unlivable, surely. Yes. So they yeah. only live within about, so it's nearly 100 million and they live within about 5% of the land of the entire country. So geographically, how big is that space? Oh, it's massive. Like, we took a bus... All the 5% the where everyone lives? Oh, the 5%? Yeah. If we were trying to compare oh, that to, let's hard. say, like... Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it? No, I'd have to pull out a map. Yeah. But, you know, Egypt's so big, you can you can drive for, you know, a dozen hours down the, down the, uh, the country. Now, some things that I took away was... One of the, one of the biggest things was... Um, there's something much bigger out there. Like, there's something, we're so much more powerful than we give ourselves credit for. 
there is something that is unprovable currently by science that I believe describes an interconnectedness between us all. The things that I saw there... Did the pyramids make you feel this way? In a way. Mm -hmm. But I would say also the people, the people I went on the tour with, the locals, the children, they really moved me. And the sp spiritual experiences that I saw other people having. This tour group was very... Went with a... Dr. Robert Schock, you can look him up, who's on Joe Rogan. He ran this tour. You know, we had a, whether it was like walking around the Sphinx, we got this very special, um, it's very rare opportunity to, the Sphinx, you can stand on top and you can look, but walking around it and touching it is a very rare opportunity. And we, we got that opportunity. And so whether it was getting an hour to do that and seeing this incredible me megalithic structure, or whether it's the awe and inspiration of looking at the pyramids, we also went inside them, many of them, and got to see deep inside them, climbing down into them, uh, down hundreds of steps, steeply into, into, the, into the pyramids. But I saw people have these metaphysical, spiritual experiences that I would previously judge or not understand, where they they look like they were connected to some type of what I've learned to be called morphic resonance. If you've heard of this, if I can morphic resonance. resonance, it's it's like there's an imprint of a past reality or a past lived experience, a pa past people in the environment. Mm -hmm. So even in, with we're in this room and I, it, we're in this room, let's say right now, I'm not saying that this is true. I'm saying this is an observation. Uh, that some people have and what I seem to maybe have witnessed. Every place and location has with it a history, not just a, not just a written history, but perhaps a, a history of emotion, a history of uh, physicality, a history of um, impermanence in, in the air, in the physical structures around you. Now, Egypt has doubt, like so many thousands of years of history, deep, rich, and there were people going on this, in these in these pyramids, in these tombs, in these special areas, and I saw them having these metaphysical, undescribable experiences. Like I saw, uh, there was these two gentlemen. Uh, they were a couple, and they're in their seventies, rich and poor, right? And I remember walking in this tomb, and then there's this light, this like stream of light that peers down uh, from the sun through the ceiling and the wall on a diagonal into the room. And these, these two gentlemen are quite connected to two things. Now I understand placebo, nocebo, but I saw something like this happen too many times uh, for me to start discounting it just simply as placebo and nocebo and just, um, or just mind games. You know, he put his hand on the wall, on the light, and I'm watching, and he he starts to eventually shake and vibrate. And th this this area is kind of known for causing some of these things. He starts to shake and vibrate, and I'm watching, and I'm just looking. And, and he's like, he's having this moment, and then he starts to get emotional, and then he starts to cry. And this is not the only moment he had on this trip, and it's not the only moment that other people had on this trip, even my mother. Now, my mother, this is, what, this is what really did. My mother had her own moment like this at, uh, mm, where was it? I'll remember later. Where was it? Oh, I'll remember. And she had a moment. And she's not a person who is this way inclined. Yeah, I get what you mean. So, you know, there's a type of person that yeah, is yeah, like yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. She's not. Yeah. So, I'm like, whoa. You, I don't think you know C, but placebo yourself because I know you and I know this is not the type of character that you have. Yet she had a moment of visualization, of feeling, of, of just something very powerful and, and, and special. And I, and I noticed many of these moments happening with different people and it, it showed me that there is probably something much bigger out there than us. And I don't mean an entity or a thing. I just mean like an interconnectedness between us all. Maybe an entity, maybe a thing. But... uh. 
my eyes are open to the soul of the universe in a way that I've never seen or had before. And it was through the gateway of these experiences with these amazing people and through looking through the eyes of of the Egyptian children the, and the locals who were just really out here just struggling to survive. And they'll try and sell you trinkets and things for 100 Egyptian pounds, which is like three uh, US dollars. And they'll be begging you out the bus, please buy my thing, buy my thing. And... You see the level of, of desperation in their eyes. You see, you see the, the intent they have to, to provide and feed their family and the simple, simple, simple living that they have. You went into some villages in Egypt and it's just, it's so bare bones and basic. You know, there, was, there were moments where I was incredibly moved uh, and emotional to seeing these people. I felt connected to them because of my history, my ancestry and seeing their suffering or, or seeing and being inspired by by how simple their living is i was about to say you see their suffering but you also see their joy from such simplicity that's because right that's i'm resonating with your feelings here from my experiences traveling in third world countries and seeing children with nothing but be happy that's right and children for me something about about them and it makes you me. question well what what makes happiness that's right you know, I think it's a very healthy observation. What what makes happiness? And, you know, I don't think happiness is, should be an attainable goal, particularly for, for a man. And there's reasons why I delineate between no, men I, and women. I agree with you. Okay, that's another conversation. But these states of joy, these states of presentness, these states of, of bliss that people experience, um, a lot of them are found in some of the most basic, excuse me, primitive actions tasks and duties mm. and i asked a couple of the locals like you know what's your favorite thing about living in egypt <laughs> the most common answer i got was family family mm. it comes down to it we can take away all the podcasts and all the money and all the superfluous things that we chase in clouts and, and and power and influence and followers and clients and leads and clothing and, and going to parties and the craziness of New York City. And it comes down to all of it. To strip it down. It's like it's people. Like people are the most important thing ever. And within that people is family. And I've never more wanted so than to have a family, have children and pass on, pass on that and we had a conversation similar to this probably last time we spoke, probably. Is that right? Mm, about family and Is it with you? And, yeah. Yeah. I know. Have you told this story? No, nah, not really, but <laughs> we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> I made a post, if people want to read more, because it's uh, hard for me to remember, because it's I have to put myself in a mind state to go there. Uh, I made it on at Alexander Emmanuel. You can, you can see my Instagram if you want to see. I did this. Um, you can look on some of the uh, the posts I did on Egypt. And you can see more of what I wrote there. But people have never been so important to me and that we are so much more powerful than we give ourselves credit for. Believe that. Believe that. I've got one more question for you. Who are your inspirations? Who has inspired you? And who do you admire? Well, there's the man on my chest. Yep. The Saad. Yep, Absolutely. The reverence, the discipline, the, I was actually visiting his uh, grave yesterday, my grandparents' grave yesterday, and I was reading the tombstones. I'm looking at all the other tombstones. It's very humbling. Mm -hmm. There's all this life that we stack on top. It's all these things that we want to be remembered for. I had a, another mentee of mine. Two of her grandparents passed away. In the same week, one week apart, it's another tragic, one. But beautiful. Yeah, the timing of it mm. because they they knew they couldn't live apart so, from each yeah, other. That's what I mean. It's 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 a like how do you explain some of that? Like yeah. how do you almost will yourself to allow yourself to die? What is that? Exactly. That's incredible. Uh, yeah, one hundred percent. It's a nice summary from the story you just told. Almost. As I'm noticing these patterns of uh, of mortality in my environment. I look at the tombstone like compassionate uh, father, uh, 
loving husband um, and then I look at my, my teta, my grandmother, teta is uh, Egyptian for grandmother and, and it describes her and it, it always talks about family, it talks about you, you, um, being a mother, uh, being a, f- a family person, uh, a mother, a, uh, a wife, a husband and a couple of the traits, you're remembered for like four or five traits, max, max, what do you want those traits to be? And at the end of the day, you can look at all these tombstones. Now, unless you're trying to Elon Musk your life and you know trying to be remembered in, in or want to be remembered in a in a uh, multi-century impactful way, which most people won't, even if you're very impactful. So, give me I don't know if you go on Prince's grave or Elvis or Michael Jackson or Kobe Bryant. I wonder what his I was grave say, says. Was Kobe Bryant one of them? Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, but Kobe Bryant especially. Because he had just had this, mm, this animal in him. And I think if you look, I'm going to answer your question more directly, but I just want to like make the point that at the end of the day, when you look at those tombstones, what are we remembered for? And it's like, what inspires me is, is that too. Mm-hmm. Is, is family, is, is, an, is the idea, I'll be careful how I say this, but the idea of God, right? Now, I'm not attaching this to a de- uh, denomination necessarily, but something else. Because you can talk about people. I talk about Saad. I talk about, you know, the Kobe Bryants. I talk about, like, Khabib Nurmagomedov. Um, I love the way he carries himself and the self-respect that he has. It reminds me quite a bit of my grandfather. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually have, um, in my old garage gym, which I coach people out of, I had the men that made me. Six, nine. I had nine images that I printed off in black and white, really quality images. And he was in the center. There was Kobe Bryant. There was LeBron. There was Khabib. I'm not going to mention them all, uh, but I have a version of that. There was uh, there was Will Smith. You know, you can see uh, growing up that Will Smith influenced uh, many of my kind of mannerisms. Sure, I can uh, see that now. You say it. Yeah, and the way I communicate. And he was the person that inspired me to get into books because he read The Alchemist, which is an amazing book. Have you heard of this? I have. Okay. And so back in those days, seeing how hard he worked, Johnny Kim, which 99% of people would not have heard of, astronaut, special forces, doctor. Speaking of resumes being obsolete, that one probably not so much. It's pretty good. Like, what the fuck? Yeah, that's... that's Like, people dedicate their whole life to that. That's a lot. So, uh, Jocko Willick, he's also one there. He interviewed Johnny Kim, and it was like, I didn't... You reframe what you think is possible. Mm. So, I pride myself on being this ultimate generalist, like you said, in being... uh, I don't need to be top 1% in every major category. I just want to be very, very good in the realms of being able to solve almost any human health problem. And now, business... And I'm looking at that, I'm like, damn, so much is possible. And that's so exciting. It also makes you reflect on how much you could be leaving on the table. Mm. Men and people who push the boundaries of human potential and redefine what excellence is, these are the people that inspire me. And who I was yesterday and who I'm going to be tomorrow, that inspires me too and my family, to be there for them and ultimately provide and protect for them. That's, that's ultimate fuel. And my ancestry, the people that came before me, it's unlimited fuel. I'm not going to disappoint them. You know how much shit they went through? Mm. You think I'm going to fuck around on some video games or some oh, I'm tired stuff? Man, I just think people disrespect so much the people that came before them. Mm. Grandparents, maybe, maybe like yours, came on a, a ship. Uh, across the world from Egypt to Australia, okay? Poor. No, actually, they did not bad, but, but they're relatively poor compared to where we are now. What about them? What about them? And it's like, man, they'd be fighting diseases and plagues and wars. Yeah. And what are you complaining about, man? It's, it was so Some people just need to hear that, don't they? But uh, Yes, they do, because they're so disconnected and disrespect the people that came before them. Mm. It's like your ancestors, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, they went through the plague and they died for what? 
for you to play video games, yeah. for you to say you're too tired to go to the gym or to turn up at your job or even apply for a job, yeah. what a waste yeah. that your ancestry dies with you. So that is what I've inspired by. Well, brother, you inspire me and you inspire many other people. Thank you very much for giving me your time today. You mentioned that you'd like to look at those hats. Good thing you like them because that is actually for you, both of those. Is brother, it? there's a living room oh, white man. top in there. Much there's love. There's a jungle t shirt in there. And uh, that's two so cats, kind bro. of you. So thank you thank so you. much. Easy, my, my man. man. Thank Appreciate you. it. Hope you enjoyed the episode, guys. See you next time.